Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if it is your first time here. My name is Jess. Today's video is going to be my wrap up of all the books that I read in the month of February and although I didn't read as much as I read in January, I still had a pretty solid reading month in February and I enjoyed the vast majority of what I read. Um, so without further ado, let's start talking about the books. As always, I'm going to review them in the order that I read them. So the first book that I read in February was a reread for me and that was Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. This is book one in the Farseer trilogy, which is the first trilogy in a series of trilogies um, set within Robin Hobb's realm of the Elderling. And I have read some of the books, but not all of the books. So I made the decision that I was going to go back to the beginning um, and just basically reread them all, including the ones that I haven't read yet. Um, and I'm going to read them in the order that you are supposed to, because there are two particular characters we have Fitz who is our protagonist in this and another character who comes alongside him called The Fool and there are a number of trilogies, bear with me, <laughs> that focus just on that set of characters but there are a number of other trilogies that kind of feed into this overarching realm of the Elderling so I'm going to try and read them all. Um, but this was a reread for me. Um, it is, as I say, it's the opening in a number of storylines so there are a lot of different little plot points that are introduced in this book surprisingly for how short it is um, and it would be very complex and complicated for me to try and explain all of those so I'll just give you the basic premise. As I said our protagonist in this book is called Fitz. At the beginning of the book although his age is not given I've always kind of pictured him around five or six he basically finds himself dumped in the town of Bookkeep. He is the illegitimate son of the king-in-waiting Prince Chivalry, a much beloved prince in the um, in this realm of the six duchies um, and Fitz's arrival is the catalyst for a number of different things. The main one being that Chivalry decides to step down from his role as king-in-waiting and he removes himself completely from court life and so, as you might imagine, because he's much beloved, Fitz becomes not very well liked because he's seen as the reason that chivalry has removed himself from court life. And we're very much following Fitz as he finds his place in this new world that he has been thrown into. Um, he's very much on the edges, um, but also he, a, a close eye is kept on him because of who he is, because a bastard-born son of the first son of the king obviously could present problems to the throne um, so he's very much watched uh, and then eventually he is picked up and he becomes the current king's assassin's apprentice and we're following Fitz in this journey. As I said there is plenty more going on that it would take me far too long to try to explain and a lot of it is only very loosely touched on in this book and it goes on to be much more developed as the story progresses and um, I love Robin Hobb's writing this was a five star read I always knew it was going to be a five star read one of the things that struck me um I think more rereading it this time round is how frustrating a character Fitz is and he is frustrating because um he just it's, we very much are following him as he comes of age and as I said as he finds his place but he makes some really poor decisions but equally he doesn't stand up for himself and it is understandable because of his history because he's never really had anyone fighting his corner and that continues to be the case there isn't really anyone who stands up for him either but he doesn't stand up for himself and it's just really difficult to read because you want to just say to him you want to kind of shake him and say come on people cannot treat you this way they can't talk to you this way stick up for yourself and he just doesn't and this being a reread I know what is coming in books two and books three and the same thing kind of happens um he lets himself be treated very poorly and he equally makes some very questionable decisions um so it is quite frustrating <laughs> but as I say love Robin Hobb's writing loved my reread of this I will continue to pick up books two and books three in March and April I'm probably going to try and read one a month um and just see how I go on these books I have said this before if you're not new to the channel Robin Hobb's books will not be for everyone although there are a lot of different plot lines happening it's not a particularly plot driven story it's very much about the characters it's a very slow burner slow developing storyline as evidenced by the fact that there are so many different trilogies that are set within this same world and we follow the same characters so the whole kind of bigger picture 
it takes a long time to develop so it definitely won't be for everyone but for me five stars loved it very very excited now to kind of continue with my reread then i picked up the flat share by beth o'leary and i was quite hesitant going into this because this is contemporary romance and i have not had the best look with contemporary romance and on top of that i know that this is a book which is very well loved in the book community and so i was a little bit hesitant for what i was going to think about it but honestly this hit such a sweet spot for me i really really enjoyed it um so basically we have two characters we have tiffy and we have leon and tiffy is just leaving an abusive relationship and she needs somewhere to live and we have leon who needs extra income and so he advertises for a flat share and tiffy takes him up on it the twist being that there are there is only one room and one bed in this flat so leon is a palliative nurse and he works nights so the basic setup is that Tiffy will occupy the bed during the night um, because she's at work during the day Leon will occupy the bed during the day because he is at work during the night and so it's quite a unique and strange setup what I really liked about this is the way that Tiffy and Leon's relationship developed so they started leaving little notes for each other um, leaving leftovers of things they baked or meals they'd made and it was a really slow and gentle developing of their relationship and it was just so sweet and I really really liked it. Um, we read from both Tiffy and Leon's perspectives and I definitely preferred Tiffy's, I felt like it was more well-rounded. Leon's was a little bit strange in that the author started writing his perspective in a really staccato and abrupt manner but she didn't always stick with it and so I felt like it was a little bit jarring whenever I was reading from his perspective and as such I didn't connect with him as much as I did with Tiffy. Um, this book also tries to deal with a number of heavier topics so we have trigger warnings for gaslighting and um, emotional emotionally abusive relationships. Um, Leon's brother has also been wrongly incarcerated um, which is something else that the book touches on and it does those pretty well um, for the type of book that this is uh, but as I say this just hit a sweet spot for me really liked the way that Tiffy and Leon's relationship developed it's a little bit twee in places it's a little bit predictable in places it is not a perfect read but for enjoyment levels as I say for that sweet entertainment um, factor it just was brilliant and I really really enjoyed it and I gave it four stars I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Next I picked up The Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden. This is the second book in the Winter Night trilogy and if you've been around my channel for a while you'll know that this trilogy is my shame because I read and adored The Bear in the Nightingale which is book one and then I just haven't picked up books two and three for some unknown reason and so I decided that at the start of this year I was going to finish this trilogy and honestly within about <sighs> two or three pages of picking this up I knew that I was going to love it. There is something about Catherine Arden's writing that I just find so intriguing and mesmerising and fascinating and just connect with so so much. Um, I loved it. Obviously I can't talk too much about what this book is about because it does pick up from book one and that would be a spoiler uh, but these are historical fiction set in medieval Russia with a magical realism, fantastical, mythological twist to them. We are following our protagonist Vasya and Vasya is able to see and interact with the old Russian house spirits, gods, mythological type creatures. Um, and at this time, at the same time, Russia is going through a period of political upheaval but also religious upheaval. So the church has arrived and the church is kind of going out into all the, the small countryside villages um, and converting people I would say and so the old spirits and gods are kind of being pushed to one side and forgotten. The first book very much had a strong sense of the fairy tale-esque you know this whole mythological type vibe to it. This book I felt like Catherine Arden tried to inject a little bit more of what was actually going on at this time historically and politically um, and so it had a slightly different vibe to it um, in that she very much tries to to combine this 
magical realism fantastical element more with actual historical fiction um so it did it felt different i still loved it i still loved it primarily because of uh, Catherine arden's writing um but it does have a different vibe to the bear and the nightingale which some people might prefer and some people might not i'm currently i said people really funny then some people might prefer some people might not um i'm actually currently reading the third and final book in this trilogy and again that has a slightly different vibe as well it's taking me a little bit longer to gel with that one um just finding it a little bit harder to get into um but on the whole i gave this five stars the the change in pace the change in tone as i say it didn't bother me really enjoyed it um would highly highly recommend again these are books that are probably quite slow um but i just i just love the way that she tells her story the way that she creates her atmosphere there's a real sense of tension and anticipation and you just don't know what is going to happen um really really enjoyed it so five stars then i read the midnight library by matt haig and this was a little bit of a disappointment for me because i really expected to love it based on the concept uh we are following our protagonist nora who suffers with depression and is not satisfied or happy with her current life she has a lot of regrets um and she feels like she's made a lot of mistakes um and those mistakes have led her to a point in her life where she ultimately doesn't want to be alive anymore so made a trigger warning for depression and suicide in this book um, and she decides to take her own life and then she finds herself in a place called the midnight library and she meets someone from her past who hands her something called the book of regrets which is literally stuffed full of all the regrets that Nora has about her life and Nora is invited to pick from the shelves and on the shelves are books which are basically alternative versions of her life so had she made slightly different decisions her life would have then turned out in various different ways and she is invited to basically try all of these different lives on and see what might have been and that as a concept I just thought was really fascinating this idea that the most minute difference to the decisions that you make um, or the actions that you take how that could so vastly alter where your life ultimately ends up it just sounded really really interesting to me um, unfortunately the book itself lacked a little bit of the depth that I was looking for. I didn't really like Nora as a character. I found her really difficult to connect with. I thought that she was particularly slow um, on the uptake um, and I felt like the reasons why she ultimately became dissatisfied with each of the lives that she tried on weren't, it wasn't very well explored. Um, so we were kind of told rather than shown the reasons why she didn't like the life so although she may have spent quite a long time um in each life we only got to have a very brief experience of Nora in that life and I just thought that it was a bit lackluster I feel like it could have been a much deeper and more developed story than it was also we are introduced to this magical realism element that of this midnight library but in one of Nora's lives she meets someone else who is going through the same thing um, I can't now remember what he refers to them as but it's almost like these um, time jumpers you know in that there's, there's an, a number of people who are trying on these different lives and it was really briefly mentioned um, and then that was it and again I thought that that was a plot line that could have been much more it could have been explored in much more depth um, and that is basically what I felt for the book. I enjoyed the concept, um, I enjoyed the premise but it lacked the depth um, for me that I was expecting so I only gave it three stars and I know that's going to be a really unpopular opinion because I've seen a number of rave reviews about this book so yeah a little bit of a swing and a miss for me. I was hoping to enjoy it much more than I did. And then, um, so last month before I tell you the book that, I'm, uh, that I read next, last month I was watching Lynette from Lynette Reads and she was talking about how she has a TBR wheel selector thing. So she's put in all of her unread books and it's this little wheel and it spins around and it tells her what she needs to pick up next um, and I really loved that idea. Um, so I decided to create a spreadsheet of all my unread books and then use a random number generator to pick a couple of books um, and you will see I'll talk about this more in my my spring TBR but I'm actually really enjoying 
not having to choose the pressure of having to choose my next read but just having it done for me so whatever book gets thrown up as long as it's not the last one in a series then um, I am picking it up and that was what prompted my next read so I used my spreadsheet and it threw up His Bloody Project by Roderick Nope by Graham McRae Burnett um, and this is such an interesting book it's one that I have picked up and considered reading a number of times and then just put it down because I thought mm, not really in the mood for it and I'm really glad that I picked it up because it's such an unusual concept it is basically a fiction um, that is written in the style of a true crime non-fiction um, so our author is looking and reviewing documents relating to the case of Roderick McRae. So Roderick McRae is a teenage boy living in the Highlands in Scotland and he is incarcerated after confessing to the murder of three people and we follow Roderick's version of events in what led up to him deciding to commit this murder we read the medical report, we read the report of a doctor who came to examine uh, Roderick um, and view him from a is he mentally unstable kind of perspective and then we follow, we read the trial man manuscript as well. So it's really um, quite an interesting concept in that you're very much reading it like it's a collection of documents and a non-fiction but it's actually entirely fictionalised. Um, but I really really enjoyed it, I, I don't think that it will be for everyone it was a little bit boring at times, um, just kind of reading some of the documentation was a little bit like, right, okay, especially because, because it's not true. But I just thought as a concept, it was really interesting and really unique. Um, I liked the way that it explored um, this idea of the lower classes um, and how they were kept as lower classes. And it was very much viewed like um, by people who are who were middle class and upper class that lower class people didn't want to do anything it was their own fault that they basically were um not very well educated you know that they were illiterate or that they lived in these really poor conditions but actually it was because of the treatment of these people by middle class and upper class that they were kept in this perpetual cycle of poverty um which obviously links in a very in a very far away manner it kind of links to what i do now which is uh, working with people who are trapped in the cycle of poverty and it, um just this misconception by people where oh you know you're kind of choosing to live in squalor but actually no that's just not the case um and just some of the injustices that were done to the people in Roderick's village um one of the things that I will say and I I kind of go back and forth on this because I understand why the author did it um he planted a lot of seeds of doubt so there were some things that didn't quite tie up between the account that Roderick gave and then the medical report for example or what came out during the trial for example and I know why he did it because in actual true crime situations not every dot would be not every I would be dotted not every T would be crossed there would be some grey areas and there would be some points where you're like these things don't tie up and there will be questions that will never be answered but because it was fiction I feel like he could have taken a liberty and just or given a summary of what he thought at the end had gone on because there were a few things that just weren't very well explored um, and I just want I was kind of like yeah but I want I want an explanation I don't want to have to come up with the explanation for myself um, but as I say I understand why he did it because of the type of book that it was um, but yeah I mean I gave it three and a half stars it wasn't like this mind-blowing book but I just really enjoyed the concept, I really enjoyed the uniqueness of it um, and as I say it did touch on some um, interesting topics such as the way that people were treated um, who were considered to be you know lower class um, and on the whole a great success for my first randomly picked book um, yeah just one that I definitely enjoyed then I picked up In the Midst of Winter by Isabel Allende I don't actually I can't actually find my copy I do have it in physical copy but I can't find it um, this was again a book that I thought based on the concept that I would enjoy a lot more than I actually did I ended up giving it two stars it just really didn't gel with me at all um, so it's a contemporary in which we are following three characters. We have Richard who is a, I think he's a professor at a university. We have Lucia who is also working with Richard but she occupies 
um, the basement apartment in Richard's building and then we have a young girl called Evelyn and in the middle of a snowstorm Richard crashes into the back of Evelyn's car. Um, they part ways and then Evelyn turns up on Richard's doorstep that evening um, and it <laughs> transpires that she has got a body in the back of her car and so Richard, Evelyn and Lucia are thrown together and they end up going on this um, mad journey. Um, Evelyn is an undocumented young girl from Guatemala, Lucia is from Chile and Richard has got ties to Brazil. I think I've got that right. And so in and amongst the present day story we jump back and explore the history of all three of our characters. I will say that at the same time that I was reading this, I was also listening to American Dirt, which explores very similar themes and topics, but I think does it so, so much better. And so possibly because the two were very similar, I've judged In the Midst of Winter a little bit harshly, but it just didn't, I just didn't get the storyline. So I really enjoyed the historical element of it. So jumping back and exploring our three characters, um, histories and pasts, and what had kind of brought them to where they were today. Really enjoyed that element. The present day storyline though was just super questionable. Like why on earth they wouldn't just report this body to the police and the things and the decisions that they make going forwards was just really very random um, and it was like, um, it was like a parody comedy crime show thing just executed really poorly like some of the some of the decisions that they make were just so ridiculous and you think yeah that wouldn't happen and then you're following these past storylines that are really quite dark and some really traumatic and awful things happen to our characters but that was almost undermined by the ridiculousness of the present day storyline I just the two things just didn't come together well for me at all um, and also Richard his storyline in fact his past storyline was just so far-fetched that I just couldn't get on with it at all um, but yeah the whole thing just based on the blurb I thought that I was really gonna like it but I felt that it was executed very poorly um, as I say I only gave it two stars it just again even thinking about it, American Dirt I think is fantastic. I haven't quite finished it, but I think that it is so, so good and so well written. Um, comparing that with In the Midst of Winter, it just doesn't compare. Um, but even taking that out, I feel like, although I enjoyed the past storylines, as I say, the randomness of the present day storyline was what let the book down ultimately for me so another one that I didn't massively enjoy unfortunately and the last book that I read in February was my book club's pick if you don't know I run a book club called just one more page um, I will leave all the information that you need if you're interested in that down below each month we're reading a different genre February was historical fiction and we picked Dragonfly by Layla Meacham this is World War II historical fiction and I was again really intrigued by the premise. We are following five idealistic young Americans who are from all different backgrounds and they all come together to become spies in occupied Paris. And as I say the whole concept sounds really interesting, these people from all different walks of life who are all joining up um, for various different reasons, we explore some of those reasons, we explore the present day situation, the high stakes of them obviously being in Nazi occupied Paris um, and the concept sounded really good. The execution was a little bit questionable and I have kind of two different mindsets. If I read it and review it from an entertainment point of view this book was very enjoyable. If I look at it a little bit more critically there were a lot of things that let this book down. Um, the main one being that our five young Americans were terrible spies. Um, we are supposed to believe that they have been through this rigorous training um, and we only kind of touch very briefly on it but we're led to believe that it was this rigorous training although they haven't um, necessarily chosen to be spies they were kind of handpicked for various reasons 
mostly being their skill with languages. Um, so they've been picked for various different reasons and approached and asked if they would do it, then they go through this rigorous training. When they get to Paris, some of the decisions that they make are so questionable and they're just so terrible at being spies that you think there's just, there's just no way that they would um that they would survive longer than five minutes and also the way that things work out while they're in paris is just a little bit too too fortuitous um and i'm sure didn't quite work out the way that the author has uh, depicted it um it's almost like a light fluffy version of what it would actually have been like and you think i'm pretty sure that it would be have been much darker much grittier much more um, cutthroat than we are led to believe in this book so it's kind of like depending which way you want to go um, would very much depend on your enjoyment of the book from an entertainment perspective really liked it really liked the element of mystery uh, we learn right at the beginning of the book that one of the five doesn't come back and then we're following their journey and it really like as, as a page turner and as a wanting to know what on earth has happened what has gone on she really gets her hooks in you um, as a reader and I just flew through the last section of the book particularly so from an entertainment point of view really on point from a kind of um, critical point of view there is a lot to be desired there are also a lot of characters to keep track of so we have our five main um, American spies who all obviously have their own names then they have their um, names as they are when they're in Paris and then they have their code names plus some of them have nicknames so some of the characters have four names that you have to try and remember who is who um, I also thought that there wasn't enough differentiation between some of them, particularly the three male characters. For a very long time I was confused about who was who and what their role was and why they were even there. Um, and I did think that those having so many characters made it quite difficult to connect with them and be invested in their storyline. And you got more of some characters than others, particularly one of the characters, Bridget who is kind of the linchpin for the team she is the the main person who communicates back with their team leader um, she is kind of the central point for the team and we got the least amount of her story but she was one of the most vital characters uh which i thought was a bit of a shame and then we also have all of the side characters you know the people that these spies are supposed to be infiltrating and connecting with plus their team leader plus his boss plus the people back at home and there's just a whole lot to keep up with and I think that on reflection what Layla Meacham would have been better doing is having a smaller number of characters that we could really as readers become invested in their stories and their journeys um, but again that sits on the more critical review side um, but if you want a fairly light fluffy easy version of spy life in World War II uh, Paris then this may well be the book for you I'm kind of a solid 3 3.5 stars um, for me but yeah just one that was all right so there you go they are the books that I read in the month of February as I say a bit of a mixed bag I had some books that I absolutely loved um, and then some that were a little bit of a swing and a miss I did mention American Dirt although I listened to the majority of this book in February I haven't quite finished it so I will wrap it up in March hopefully if I manage to get it finished I've got about five hours left to listen to um, but yeah that is it if you got to the end thank you very much for watching do leave me a comment let me know what your favorite book in February was let me know if you've read any of the books that I talked about and what your thoughts were if you enjoyed this video don't forget to give it a thumbs up subscribe to the channel if you aren't already I hope that you are all keeping safe and well take care and I will see you soon